Hi there, and welcome to another edition of Newscast Interviews in Full. Well, in this podcast today, we're discussing a topic which often divides quite a lot of people on the Isle of Man, wallabies. Earlier in the week, we had this voicemail left with the newsroom. Hello, um, it's to do uh, with the um, wallabies that have now increased their range of uh, where they are uh, penetrating the uplands. I actually have video of a wallaby bouncing in front of me along the Pot Road. Um, it's about time that we stop treating like um, with kid gloves and we need to trap them and put them back into the wildlife park or euthanize them because the damage they are causing to the ecology of the uplands, the ecology of the wetlands, um, it's a deafer problem and they are responsible for managing and retaining carbon capture um, but the wallabies now are just, they are becoming uncontrollable and they're diseased. So if you could possibly mention this, I know it's one of these sensitive subjects where people think they are fluffy little things, but they are causing considerable damage now. And if they're up the uplands, up Penny Pot Road, then um, they'll be in your gardens, they'll be in, um, in all the uh, scientific areas of scientific interest. Uh, and it's it's about time that they were treated as vermin as what they are. Thank you very much. Well, after that clip was shared on the Man in Line, the floodgates opened, with many commenting that the wallabies are a beloved part of our island now and should be treated as a native species, whilst others said they are damaging to the ecosystem and should be culled. Well, we wanted to get a more informed view on this matter, so spoke to a couple of people in the know. Firstly, park manager of the Kirk's Wildlife Park, where the species first escaped from decades ago, Kathleen Graham. Well, as far as I'm aware, obviously I arrived uh, on the Isle of Man in 2012. So um, the wallabies were out in the Currucks a long time, obviously, before I arrived. Um, But from what I was told, obviously I got a bit of history. There's certainly one um, record of a wallaby escape right at the beginning of the park, I think 1965. Um, there's then verbal reports of a wallaby breakout in the early 80s um, due to storm, as far as I know. Um, it was trees down on a fence. Um, so I'm told. So I've always believed that, yes, certainly the, the wallabies come from the wildlife park. Um, however, doing um, WI talks around the island, uh, one lady confirmed to me that there had been wallabies in Mackold in the 1950s. And I thought it was an excuse, you know, the wallabies didn't come from the wildlife park, they came from there. But uh, she verified that, yes, there was wallabies there in the 1950s. But I think it's safe to say that, that, you know, the majority of the population there has come from the Currucks Wildlife Park at some point. And obviously you spend a lot of your time uh, in and around the Currucks and... uh... The, the wallaby population there, how, how has that changed in, in your time since 2012? And, and how healthy are these animals? Because we talk about uh, the ecosystem and how they're ingrained into it at the minute. Have they adapted quite well, would you say? Yeah, I mean, the wallabies have adapted very well because it's ideal habitat for them, really. Um, it's hard to say how well they're doing or how the numbers have grown unless you're actually doing the regular research. Now, there was... Um, a study done by Paige Havlin a number of years ago um, and she had estimated the population then around 120. So I think the recent Manx Wildlife Trust survey is really the first one being done since then and it's shown that there is, you know, the population has grown around the Currucks and I'm not surprised because it is ideal habitat. They've got, um, you know, plenty of food out there, plenty of water, plenty of shelter. And, of course, there's no natural predators for them here in the Isle of Man. And wallabies are known to kind of congregate in fairly large numbers where the resources are good. What's your view of the wallaby population out there? Is it something that we kind of need to protect? You're always going to get different views. And even from scientists, even people who have a lot of knowledge about animals and knowledge about the ecology, um, at the end of the day, we're human and we've got biases and, you know, we like animals and wildlife and the wallabies themselves do seem very unoffensive you know it's a lot of people like to wallaby spot um so you know as an individual um yes I still even as a wildlife park manager I still get a bit of a thrill if I see a wild wallaby or a wild hare or other or other wild animals um the question 
is, you know, many people say, well, should they be there? And you could say, well, no, they shouldn't be there, but they are there. And there's a lot more research that needs to be done. There needs to be long-term research. We need to actually see what are the wallabies doing? What is the impact on the local ecology? And there could be positives as well as negatives. And you've got to approach that from an unbiased view. Um, But long-term wise, you know, me being in the zoo world and having concentrated on um, safety, backup populations in zoos, linking that to conservation work in the field. Uh, there's also an opportunity, if you like, for the Isle of Man to have one of the biggest backup wallaby populations. Now, we might say, OK, they're not endangered. The IUCN have, have uh, listed them as least concern. But... When you think about what happened in Australia recently in the 2019-2020 fires, a lot of the fires were around the region where those wallabies live. And when you look at Australia as being more negatively impacted by um, global warming and is heating up, um, it's not inconceivable. It might seem at this point in time um, to be, oh, it couldn't be possible that the wallabies would become an endangered species. But it's not unfeasible. If you look 30 or 50 years to the future, when we're talking about how much the planet's warming up, and when we've seen that Australia has literally lost billions of wildlife, including one species um, of bat to the, known as the flying fox, literally one third of the population dropped out of the trees, dead from the temperatures. Here's an opportunity the Isle of Man has to have a population um, that can be studied as well because it's a great easy access, as easier access than it is in Australia to do a lot of study and research on this population. Um, so without that further knowledge, that scientific-based approach, we cannot say whether we should or shouldn't do anything about the population Certainly, without the natural predators, if you look at Scotland, for example, with the the red deer populations where there's no longer wolves to control them, um, a culling is necessary, a a certain amount culled every year to protect the welfare of the the rest of the herd so that they're not outstripping natural resources um, and not having a kind of boom and bust of the population. Um, But... Really, there's been very little research done on our wallaby population and we're really just at the start of that journey, understanding what what they're doing out there and there could be positives as well as negatives. So I think we really need to know all that information over a number of years before we could have a serious conversation around whether the population needs at least a, a limited cull for the welfare of the rest of the wallabies. Park manager Kathleen Graham from the Wildlife Park there. Well, a thermal imaging survey of the Currics earlier this year discovered there were around 570 red-necked wallabies calling our island home. The study was carried out by the Manx Wildlife Trust, of which Lee Morris is CEO. The holistic view of Manx Wildlife Trust is that we need to know more about them, is that they're a non-native um, animal they escaped from the wildlife park 50 or 60 years ago. They built up a population. They're clearly having some impact on the environment. Um, they eat, you know, a wallaby clearly eats something and it walks. So it's having some impact. And we'd like to understand what that is. We're, we're very conscious that it's a very emotive topic. They're lovely, fluffy animals. We all love to see them. Um, and so we don't want to come out with any extreme opinions other than we'd really, really like to know more about them. And hence the reason why we now as an organisation are doing that to get a more information and evidence about what the po- population in the Isle of Man is, is, is all about. We we saw the, the Wildlife Trust uh, had some thermal imaging uh, done of, of the Currucks earlier this year. What has that told us about the population that we didn't know before? Well, I'm going to, I never use the word I, I always talk about an organisation, but I'm going to use the word I for hopefully some effect, is that the I watched the entire survey done of the Balaf Kurok, and I watched it twice. I was so amazed at the number that we counted the first time that I went away and thought about it for a day and, and said to the guy that we contracted to do it that I felt we really need to go back and do it again because the, the number was so high. So, and we did it and the difference was 10. So he and I are 
completely assured that the count we got in the curric is correct. And there's about 570, 560 to 580 wallabies, you know, in what is 200 uh, hectares of what, and it's also our major, most important conservation area on the island. And and I'm everything I'm saying to you, I'm trying to say as facts, not opinions. I, I really don't want to get in a mudslinging fight with people. I want people to make their own views, but we want to give them information to make them with. So the Ramsar site, the Balaf Kuruks, is the only Ramsar site on the island. It's an area of special scientific interest. It's really, really important for the island. And, and people need to recognise that. And the wallabies are now, there's about 600 wallabies in the Balaf Kuruk area. Um, and other conservationists have said for many years to me that, you know, the Isle of Man, before I moved here, for example, was renowned for its hen harrier population. And the Balaf Kuruks was lauded as a, you know, as a place where, you know, the, the more hen harriers roosted in the Balaf Kuruks than anywhere else in the British Isles. It's a really important raptor bird. And there are hardly any there now. And people have suggested to me that the reason they're not there now was because of the wallabies. Now, I openly found that difficult to believe and 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 you know we've done a count and what is clear in the count is that there isn't any areas in the black curragh on the the two nights i saw where there weren't any areas where hen harriers could have been roosting where there were significant numbers of wallabies we had 50 60 70 wallabies in some of the fields so there's a lot of large animals running around in areas that i'm told used to be internationally renowned as roosting sites for hen harriers. So that's one example. And we'd like to know if that's the reason why hen harriers are not there. So I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying the wallabies need to be culled. But I am saying the fact that there are hundreds of wallabies, there is no longer any hen harriers roosting there. And maybe the two are correlated. And as an island, we have, you know, a duty, and certainly as Manx Wildlife Trust, whose main absolute mission is to care conserve and restore Manx nature, then I think we need to be getting evidence to allow us to best manage Manx nature as an island. You've described the importance of the Kirk site and uh, just exactly what makes it uh, an area of special interest. Would the wallaby population survive or have survived anywhere else on the island if they'd have escaped? Um, I think the conditions there... um, are more akin with what I believe they would find in their native Tasmania. But um, we only counted them in the Kuruks. But I know from my three to four years on the Isle of Man now that there are sightings as far south as Dolby Mountain, you know, Ramsey Prom, you know, the, the, the wooded areas south of the Balaf Kuruks. And again, this this is a, um, a fact that from the, the person that surveyed them, in his words, he's never seen such large numbers of large mammals in such a confined area anywhere other than monk jack deer in Norfolk. So all the red deer, all the deer in Scotland, the population densities don't come anywhere near to the number of wallabies in the Balaf Curragh. And we know that the sightings are you know, spreading, spreading further across the island. Now, if the population density is that high, an ecological view would be that naturally the wallabies are going to start spreading. So I think there are other, you know, woodland areas, the Isle of Man climate is very, very similar to, to Tasmania. So it's not a bad place for a wallaby. I don't think they are unhappy. I mean, there is the issue of the health of them. You know, we certainly have photographs of wallabies being blind. You know, maybe they're inbred. You know, I used to work in the zoo world. I worked in Edinburgh Zoo. I had an office near a wallaby walk round. It was a fantastic experience. People would love to go in and immerse themselves in nature with wallabies. And, and we have that on the Isle of Man. Um, it's a precious thing, perhaps. But, you know, the, the, the questions about our, our island's nature and, and biosphere, we, we need to look at them and try and look at them in an evidence-based way and ask ourselves the questions. You know, maybe we're happy as an island that if it is proved that the hen harriers aren't there anymore because of the impact of wallabies, then maybe we're happy that we say that. But I would suspect that, you know, if I suggested that we got rid of all the hen harriers, I think there would be uproar, rightly, because they're a really important Manx bird. And people need to know that there are far, far less of them now. And if it's shown to be the wallabies, then I would hope that people would value hen harriers and want to make sure that the hen harrier population in the island, amongst other wildlife, um, was was precious for us because that's our Manx heritage. 
And I've discussed this matter with um, with Kathleen Graham, uh, the man- park manager from the Kirk's Wildlife Park, who who said as well, like you, more it would be nice to get more research about the population here, but also saying that on a global context, the w- wallabies in Australia are quite at risk from wildfires like we've seen in the, in recent years. So it, it, it's it's that extra onus of having a backup population here. Is that something that's been taken into consideration as well? No, I, I'm I'm very concerned. I've got a lot of respect, and, and I like Kathleen a lot. So I'm not going to disagree with her. Certainly not on air. I think I don't know the answer to that, but I do respect Kathleen's view in the zoological world. But but I think we need to go and prove that. But you could say. <laughs> um, Maybe we need to be, be a, the Isle of Man needs to open up its door then for a thousand other species rather than randomly the one that escaped from a wildlife park and built up naturally. I, I think tactically, if we really want to be an island for uh, in mitigating against the impact of climate change on global animal species, then I would suggest that we really need to have a proper strategy on which species we're best hosting here. I know people have talked for years about red squirrels. You know, and, and then maybe there's a whole list of other animals that we could bring to the Isle of Man. But when you bring an animal into an ecosystem, you impact on the whole ecosystem, whatever that animal or plant is. So you bring a new you bring a new organism in and it has an impact. It might be small. It might take a long time to actually manifest itself. It may never be that much of a problem. But but, you know, big animals are noticeable um, and they're in the ecosystem and they're growing. And. I'm very, very conscious. You know, I sit on the Visit Isle of Man board. I know that, you know, people in Douglas and the the people that ring up uh, phone lines and and care about the island will, you know, look at a wallaby and think it's a lovely, nice, fluffy, big animal. Um, What damage are they doing? Well, maybe people need to need to be clear that there are many other animals that we could bring and, and maybe they are doing damage and we need to know more. So we know that there is an attraction of wallabies. We're keen that we don't go off with 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 unsubstantiated opinions, but we are concerned that this large animal is got now to a population of hundreds. And and as an aside, I've been in meetings for the you know three to four years that I've been here, where if wallabies ever came up in conversation, and these were conservation meetings or meetings with you know DEFA and and, and other conservation NGOs, there would be passionate opinions in the room. People who would be just as passionate against them as passionate for them to the point where you couldn't have a rational conversation. And one of those areas was around numbers. You know, people have, you know, almost with vitriol said to me, there's only 20 or 30 of them. You know, you don't even need to ask the question. Whereas other people say there's thousands of them and they're doing masses of damage. Well, now we have a robust bench line, bench, you know, a line in the sand of how many wallabies there are in the Balaf Kurak. And, and maybe the 50, 60 years of the wallabies on the island, there's not going to be an immediate change of anything. But let's say we repeat that survey in two or three years' time, and there's a 1,500, or maybe there's only 200. At least now, Manx Wildlife Trust feel that we've got some credible evidence, a line in the sand, that allows the island to better have conversations about wallabies, and more importantly, better have conversations about our most important conservation designated area, which is the Balaf Kurut, where the bulk of the population we believe live. So just finally on that research, then you mentioned about uh, more surveys down the line. In how many years do you reckon we, we can actually stand back and say definitively this is what needs to happen? I think there's enough information in the world now that if we if we and the as we as in the island felt this was a priority, there would be enough basis now of desk research and some more survey work that could be done right now to allow the island to get enough evidence to potentially make a plan for for, for if or what happens with the wallabies. Um, we're doing other research. We, we've got a baseline count. We're also now um, we've put fences up that we believe will keep wallabies out of some of our nature reserves in the Kurok. And we're putting camera traps up both sides and we're photographing the, the impact of wallabies on the land that's outside our nature reserve compared to the land inside. And we're camera trapping so that we can prove what any difference is attributable to. So we're doing that. We, we, we've also collected wallaby dung 
over the seasons. Um, and we've had one go at doing eDNA analysis on that to get the information of the plant species that they eat. Um, it wasn't as successful as we'd hoped the first time, so we need to repeat that and we're planning to. Um, and I think that's just all about building up the picture. And again, I repeat this, it's about getting facts, not uns unsubstantiated opinions that would just be inflammatory and then people are going up in arms about either save the wallabies or get rid of the wallabies. And we really, really feel it's an important topic that we want the island to have credible, sensible, informed discussions and maybe decisions about. And I use the word maybe because we need to have the proper information and discussions before we get to that point. Manx Wildlife Trust CEO Lee Morris there. So, love them or hate them, it seems before any decision is made about what to do with the island, wallabies, we need to know a bit more about them. That's all for now. I've been Lewis Foster, Gura Mayed, and thank you for listening. Thank you for making it to the end of the Little Manx Radio newscast. You are obviously someone with exquisite taste. May I politely suggest you might want to subscribe to this and a wide range of Manx Radio podcasts at your favourite podcast provider so our best bits will magically appear on your smartphone. Thank you.